fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Nerd on Kingdom. 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 1050 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren, Mr. John Copenhaver. How are you doing? I'm doing swell, Al. Swell. Uh, There's a good old-fashioned word. <laughs> swell. Well, you know, you know, we're right in the 1950s and 40s. So after it comes, slips into the old, uh, you know, swell golly gee whiz, you know, that just slips out sometimes. <laughs> You're probably wearing the old hat and everything, you know, dressed up, yeah. dressed up like the characters, you know, as your writing and. Oh God, save me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and outright you competed that this weekend and so it was a real success everything went well yeah outright was a success i had a great uh panel on sunday which you can view on youtube um wow yeah i mean it was we were just talking about uh queer lives and crime fiction do you guys have any fights or anything exciting or put down anyone that we need to know ahead of time no oh. no we we all like each other immensely <laughs> and so probably doesn't drive engagement but um no <laughs> nothing like a little bit of controversy you know i know i know alas alas well, but exciting. you're very interesting <laughs> Yeah, I'll call someone a name. I don't know. Anyway, okay, well, today we are back at her, and it's Monday, and we've got a writer here, and uh, let's bring him in and talk about his new book. The new book's called Saving Miles, and our guest is the author of that book, Carl Vondero. How are you doing, Carl? Good, good, thanks. Thank you, Alan. Thanks for uh, inviting me on the show. Yeah. Well, listen, Carl, who, who are you saving miles from? <laughs> <laughs> from uh, yeah. Well, it's, you know, the whole family ends up having to be saved. <laughs> so, um, yeah, saving miles from, uh, he's a troubled teenager, and um, he's had problems all the way through school, and then his parents discover that he's got Oxycontin in his closet, so they have to save him, and then they have to save him later. This is a pretty intense story in a way. How, how do you come up with something like this? This is sort of something that um, you kind of come across as an idea and then you kind of build characters into the story? Or do you actually have, did you have the characters like Miles and, and a few others maybe that you've created and you turn them into a story? Yeah, well, both things happen, actually, because um, my whole my whole motto is families are involved in all crimes. So behind every crime is a family, uh, both on the perpetrators and the victims. So my stories have a lot of family elements in it. So I wanted this story to be about that. In this case, I thought, well, how about a family where the teenage years have been a challenge and troubled, and it's driven the parents apart, and they have their own reasons for being apart. So it's kind of dysfunctional that in that way. At the same time, I wanted to uh, bring into the plot uh, something with a sketchy bag. I thought that would be fun because, you know, like uh, John Grisham and the firm had a sketchy law firm. Well, this time it's a sketchy bank involved in a lot of money laundering. So you mix all those elements together. Yeah, it's quite a process. How do you do your characters? This is kind of where I want to get at. So when you create the characters you're going to put in the book, do you actually flesh them right out yourself or do you do it as you write the story? Um, I try to flesh them out a bit beforehand. So I do character sketches, you know, and I do outlining, um, you know, as to what their flaws and weaknesses are, what are their goals and desires and their fears. And so, you know, I, I sketched out the boy because I've known people that um, have, have sent their kids to treatment centers. I sketched him out, what that's like, what it's like to be forced into a treatment center, what it's like to go through that. And then I sketched out the parents, too, as to why why they were estranged. Father's a workaholic, was absent raising the son. 
Um, but now he realizes, you know, what he's missed and he wants to be closer to his wife and son. The, the mother had the son very early. She's given up her career and much of her youth for dealing with Miles' troubles and rescuing him all the way through, really. Um, so, you know, I define all those elements before I start writing. And then as I write, the characters, you know, I get clearer. Where did you get into writing? Like, how did it start for you where you knew you were going to be a writer? Boy, this started a long time ago. <laughs> when I was a kid in elementary school, I would be making up ghost stories, stories all the time. And um, I can remember my third grade teacher telling my mother that um, that the story was clever, but rather weird. <laughs> and then... Uh, and then uh, morbid was the word she used, and I thought that was great. I had no idea what morbid meant. But um, and then you know I I was writing stories and poetry and writing music in in high school. Uh, went to college and really concentrated on uh, studying something where I could have a career. And I did. I wanted to work internationally, so you know I studied that and studied in Colombia. And it wasn't until I got into the banking world after college that I went back to my first love of writing fiction. And, you know, I've, I've done this for, for many years. And, uh, you know, when we uh, I did it when we lived in Montreal, and then when we came here, I had all sorts of resources to help me do that. And that really, uh, that enabled me to get better, good enough to publish my first book, which was Murderabilia. You know, you, you know, I sort of see your tagline here, you've mentioned it too, is, you know, behind every crime is a family. And it's really interesting to me, because I think at crime fiction, uh, mystery thrillers are often sort of about plumbing the depths of family issues. Um, is that is that sort of what your you know I guess your angle is is, is how you you look at families through crime fiction? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, because the uh, the crime energizes all the problems. It it makes all the problems bigger in the family, and uh, the family really has to solve some of those issues in order to solve the crime. Um, and the, so. Uh, you know, they're faced with an external threat, and the only way to save themselves is to come together, forgive themselves, learn to cherish each other, see the heroism in each other. So um, I think I'm plumbing all of that. What are the, what are the dysfunctions, and how do they overcome them in order to, to solve the crime? Yeah, it's almost like the healing of the family has to be a part of the solution of the problem. Like it's a two, <laughs> uh, a parallel, a parallel issue, um, which, uh, you know, sounds very compelling. Um, that's it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting, uh, because in, in the book, I'll just, I can give you a brief description of, I mean, the son has been, uh, troubled all the way along. The parents, when they find Oxycontin in his closet, force him to go to a treatment center in Utah. And when he comes back, um, he seemingly is totally healed. But um, he, it, he, in fact, wants to get back at his parents, goes to Mexico to do a drug deal, and gets kidnapped. So, you know, all those problems haven't been solved, and now they have to be solved. Yeah, it sounds really compelling. You know, uh, Oxycontin has been such a, a topic... Um, I, I grew up in, uh, you know, southwestern Virginia, Appalachia, and um, and so which has been devastated, uh, of course, in many ways by that drug. Um, it was a very good miniseries, Dope Sick. Yes, I saw that. Yeah, and I just wonder, like, I mean, I, I'm curious about your choice of that drug. Is that something you're you're sort of exploring or talking about in this? Um, uh, or is it, you know, something you know on your mind? Um, no, I was exploring and talking about it because what problem would be so severe that parents would force their kids again, kid against his will to go to a treatment center? And so uh, OxyContin would be that. It seems that he's about to use. In fact, he wasn't using it. He was just holding it for someone. But the road is clear where he's heading. And, um, and, and I did this book a little different than differently than uh, most thrillers. You know, most thrillers begin with a crime, a murder, or a threat of some part. But I began actually a year before the plot really starts to take off. And that's when the two parents are uh, waiting for two strangers to arrive to forcefully take their son to the treatment center. 
And you can see the anguish of the parents that they don't want to do this, but they have no choice. And the, you see the relationship between the, the mother and the father. And I tried to do that to give an emotional connection to those characters uh, before the plot even begins. Did you, did you actually have a subtext then? Did you have kind of a, a, a meaning that you hope a reader gets um, by the end of the book? Yeah, yeah, I think, um, again, it's that the external threat can force the family to come back together again, and then they really learn how to forgive each other and cherish one another, and also that no matter how troubled the teenager is or how broken the marriage, there's heroism underneath. So those are the things I'd like the reader to come away with, besides just turning the pages. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> we want that, right? Well, it's helpful. Yeah. You know. I mean, we don't want them to get bored. No. No. <laughs> when you write the uh, evil character or the evil characters, the ones doing bad things in your book, how do you get into that character to make it sound convincing? Um, I, I try to get inside their head. And, you know, the old adage that um, um, every villain is a hero to himself, uh, there's something that drives them. And with these characters, it's about family as well. Uh, so the characters that are doing all the evil have two principles that I put in, um, the cartel, really. And one is that their children must survive, and two, that their children must live better lives than they do. Um, and, you know, that's really what drives these people. Their hero is the Kennedy family, where the father was a bootlegger and the son was president. So they want their children to uh, live uh, uh, a life that is not tainted by crime and in the highest uh, highest echelons of society. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's how how develop these people get in there. do you have characters that stay with you even after you finish a book that you kind of still think about um after it's done yeah yeah as a matter of fact um there's a character there's another banker in this book named chad and he was actually um in murderabilia in that book my prior book and the book was too long and too many characters so i cut him out he stayed with me, and I put him in this book. I'm glad I did. He works much better in this book. Um, the characters certainly, um, you know, what the boy went through, um, what the the father, um, the way he feels about um, his career and sort of grabbing on to all of life, um, that stays with me. And we've certainly all gone through some of that. I mean, I worked pretty hard as a banker in long hours, and um, you always feel that you should have given more time to your family even, you know, no matter how much time you give to them. Do you, now, I know you probably had some, um, ex, I don't want to say experience in, 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 in criminal banking, but you probably had some knowledge of how someone might go about doing that, but I'm sure you had to do some research as well. Like, what, what went into that? I'm curious. Well, yeah, and I have had people try to launder money oh, with me. I can oh, wow. remember in Canada. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in, when I was in Montreal, we had some guy come in from the Turks and Caicos who pretended that uh, he was going to invest money in some kind of mining project in northern Quebec, and all his money came from Arab sheikhs. He had pictures of him standing next to these Arab sheikhs, <laughs> and then he had two people who knew nothing about his business. I mean, you know, you get this kind of stuff in banking. So uh, my, my boss threatened to... Um, to do a full investigation on him, at which point he tore up his resume and said, "You deal with the other two people. I'll I'll stay out of the out of the deal." You know, and, and another guy who was a trading company who he did pulp and paper kinds of things, and he would routinely over invoice and take the the difference and put it into a bank account for one of his clients, or pay for their hotels, or buy things for them. I mean, you know, it happens, but. Um, the real money laundering in this book uh, really comes from from study. Um, I, didn't, I you know I've got operations banking experience, but I don't know that much about money laundering. So um, I I enrolled in some courses with an organization called ACAMS, Association for Certified Anti Money Laundering Specialists. They're uh, an international organization all over the world, primarily 
uh, bankers as well as um, government, you know, DAs and, and uh, prosecuting attorneys. Um, so I took some courses from them. Then I also uh, talked to two FBI agents about money laundering, what they do. I talked to a DEA agent about what, what money laundering they, they do as well. So, um, you know, there's a lot of, some of that is in the book. And uh, when you look at money laundering, there are three phases. Uh, the first is placement, where they're trying to just get the funds into the financial system. The second is called layering, where they try and move the money all around so you can't really tell where it came from. And then the third one is called um, integration, where they then will invest that money into legitimate projects. So, for instance, if you look at the uh, at the uh, Tijuana cartel, um, most of this was a family that ran this. And all the brothers basically were in prison or killed, except the one daughter in the family who was an accountant. And so now the rumor is that she has made arrangements with all the other cartels to eliminate violence, and they in, invest in things like real estate and pharmacies uh, and other things. So kind of using that money going legit. That's fascinating. I know my, my reference point for all of this, and forgive me, but actually I thought the show was yeah. Ozark. Did you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that really is a lot. It feels like that's the central sort of premise of the whole show is the money laundering plot. And it's very exciting. Was that ever an issue? Like how you, how do you make this kind of technical white collar crime, you know? Uh, yeah. It's a, it's a big issue because it's, you have to simplify it to some extent because the reader doesn't want to, Read about how it went from this LLC to this foundation to this other, you know, trust overseas. I mean, it, it gets boring. So you have to simplify it to some extent. Uh, and the other thing that most people don't know about is that a lot of money laundering is done through international trade. You know, so uh, there was um, there was a money launderer who they had all these dollars. They bought potatoes in in Idaho and shipped all the potatoes, I guess, for French fries in Latin America, and got their money there that way. All kinds of methods. How did you launder your money? <laughs> Come on. Very, we won't tell anybody. Very carefully. Very carefully. We won't tell anybody. Just <laughs> the, the, the lucrative book business. <laughs> yeah, oh, boy. Yeah, that, <laughs> that wasn't a real success. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't work so well, but it's 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 the idea of it. You just keep on trying. Yeah, right? you keep on trying. Well, for instance, some people don't know that um, you know the U.S. dollar is a currency internationally. You can pay U.S. dollars just about anywhere, right? So uh, cartels will ship. They'll do bulk shipments of U.S. dollars out of the U.S. to Hong Kong or to Mexico or wherever. And then in Mexico, they'll deposit all these funds with, you know, exchanges like Casas de Cambio. And so they'll look legal or they'll do it at resort areas. They'll accumulate all those funds together and say they're from the tourist industry. And they'll ship all that cash back to the U.S. as legitimate proceeds. You know, what, what, what made you go from a career like being a banker and all that? Was there something that happened to make you feel confident enough that you felt you could write and sell books? Well, I I just wanted to do it, and I, and I took courses and had writing coaches and went to writers' conferences, all secretly. I didn't tell anyone at the bank this is what I was doing because it wasn't real career-enhancing. And then uh, finally the first book got published, but, you know, it took a long time, and there was another book I wrote that never got published. And then you have to go public. But by then, I didn't care. Yeah. It came out. <laughs> it came out. I was a writer. <laughs> yeah. Now, now I'm going to get rich being a writer. <laughs> nothing but bestsellers, you yeah. know? <laughs> I, banking's really not lucrative compared to writing. No, no. I think you just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can launder a lot more now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Because everybody, you know, when, you, when you're selling books outside the bookstore, they pay in cash. Yeah, that's, <laughs> there you go. See, we're figuring out secrets here. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, so what do you think of it? What do you, what, what do you like about writing now that you're actually publishing, uh, and what do you dislike? Yeah, um, 
Well, liking is, you know, you get an, into a flow sometimes when things just are clicking. And well, and I'll back up a step. The way I write the first draft is by hand, so I'll do it on a legal pad. And um, I'll have a scene and I'll have a conflict that, you know, I just ju write as fast as I can on the page. And when you're really in the flow, the characters are ahead of his, ahead of you when you're writing. So I can't write fast enough to keep up with the characters. And that's a great feeling, you know. And then you get four or five pages and you think, well, maybe this will work. I've got something here. So that's always satisfying. Um, I think it's satisfying to get into the point of view of someone totally unlike you. I mean, in this book, there, there are three points of view. There's a mother, a father, and a teenage son. It's mostly sold, told from the father's point of view, but I had to really get into the mother's point of view. And she's a woman who's uh, been so frustrated with her husband that she kicks him out of the house and she has an affair with, a, with, with someone else. And I had to get into, how do you make her sympathetic? Why would she do that? So, you know, I read a lot of Esther Pearl and the reasons why people are dissatisfied with their marriages. And uh, so it helped me understand that point of view. I mean, even a teenager... Uh, to get into his point of view was trouble because I'm, you, um, people can't see me, but I've been around for a while. But you're not a teen anymore. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. And so, how do you get into that? On this, I mean, at first I tried to, I, I was looking up all kinds of teenage slang and, and doing that. And, um, Carolyn Wheat, my writing coach, she said, so, do you think your readers should need a dictionary to read your work? <laughs> uh oh. The Urban Dictionary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then she said, Who are your readers? <laughs> and they're not teens, you know? So then I drew back from all of that. And I used a few words here and there of slang, but you could understand in context. Really tried to get into the teenager in terms of what was most important to him. I mean, he uh, wanted to rebel against his parents. He resented them for sending him to a treatment center. Love was huge uh, in his life because he's, you know, 16 to 18 years old in the book. And um, he's very idealistic, you know, that wonderful idealism of a teenager. Um, so that's the way I tried to get into his point of view. Um, so those are the things I like, going back to your original question. Uh, uh, and the things that I don't like, um, i got to tell you, I, I don't like outlining. I don't like doing character sketches. It's just like hitting your head against the wall. And uh, But it's necessary to get it off the, off the ground. So I, I much prefer the writing process. And even though I outline, and, you know, um, I use Plotter on, this, on the latest book, and... Um, but it changes all the time because as you write, you come up with better twists and your character would act a little differently in this way or that way. So when I like that, um, and of course, it's always frustrating when you go into your writer's group and you think you've been brilliant and they tell you you've missed the barn. So, or, or the later revisions. I mean, I do a lot of revisions. And uh, so by uh, the last revisions are tough. Editors are awful. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, you know, in Murderabilia, I wrote it more than 20 times. And the last ones were worse than some of the ones before. So that's something I have to guard against over, over revising. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cause it can go somewhere and, that you prefer it not to. Like it can change into something that's not good. Yeah. And you lose some of the good aspects of the book because you're trying to fix something that somebody, you think somebody told you. And maybe you cut out, uh, in, in this book, um, I almost cut out the teenager's point of view. Really because... interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting to me is that if you take everyone's advice and try to apply it, ultimately it becomes this sort of Frankenstein monster, you know? And even well-intentioned editors, you do, and even sometimes edits that are good, you still have to sort of, I think, push back if it doesn't feel like it's, you know, really adhering to your original. And I bet you're going through some of that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, I mean, we we sent this book out to all kinds of acquisitions editors, and some of them said, well, they thought it bounced around too much because I was going, I was jumping from one point of view to another in these chapters. And 
I thought, well, I don't really understand a teenager that well, so maybe I'll take him out. And I even started revising taking him out, and I think that would have made the book so much weaker. Um, and then the other way we did it was my agent said, look, why don't you do blocks of chapters in these points of view? So you get the point of view in three or four chapters of one character, and then you switch another to another character for another three or four. So that helped um, make those transitions. It's interesting how much a reader will put up with going back and forth between points of view and, and how much they need to get embedded in a point of view to get yes. uh, attached to that character. There's like this fine balance between those. I've had, uh, I always like writing multiple points of view and I've had the same issue come up. Um, oh, like, yeah. Um, you know, do, do you find like, you know, as you are, are using, I noticed you, you mentioned using plotter. Um, has that really helped your sort of organization of the plot? Um, I know that lots of people use different products and that kind of thing. I'm always fascinated by it. I love great plots. I'm always fascinated by these products that sort of support that. Well, Plotter helped. It helped a lot. I put, um, um, I'm thinking more of the book that I've just turned into my editor, but I could put different characters along different plot lines so I could see if they came into the book with enough frequency or too much frequency, um, and helped me establish where the high points of tension were. Were they too far apart? Were they too close together? Um, but the problem with Plotter is you can't really see the whole book unless you, you really minimize it so that you can't read anything. So um, then I tried to do uh, I tried to do a cork board with, and even then it's it's hard to see how the whole book how the pace of the book is going um and whether you need more of one character or less of one character when, when you go through the experience of writing a book like when you went through saving miles and now that it's done and and coming yeah. out um how do you think it's changed you as a writer um well i'll go back to a story um saving miles was originally just i was i'd written a fair amount of it in just the father's point of view and so I went to my agent and I told her about it. And she said, you know, I really like books with multiple points of view. And you can imagine what my reaction was. Oh, my. <laughs> and, but I decided to take the challenge. And so and I made it in third person rather than first person. Uh, my other book was all in first person. So that helped me uh, get better at writing uh, in third person and different points of view, uh, distinguishing the mother from the father, for instance, in terms of, of how they came across and what their voice was like, and then, of course, the teenager. Um, so that all strengthened me as a writer, um, and I think I like third person more than I like first person at this point. Now, your relationship with your characters, how do you, can, how, how do you describe that? Are your characters strong enough that they can actually change the plot themselves? Yeah, I think so. Um, well, the father was easiest character because it's, you know, closest to me, and he's a banker like I was uh, in a different sector of banking. But he was a driving force. And then the mother, she got stronger and stronger, and she actually begins to influence the father as well as the FBI and DEA, and she ends up being the strongest person in the book. And then, of course, the son, who, where love is everything at the beginning of the book, sort of grows into a man, and he realizes the kinds of sacrifices you have to make for love. Um, so I, I can see all that in myself better, having uh, written it into these characters and experienced it with them. Yeah, it's an interesting process. So where do you see yourself going now? You know, give up this big... Uh, banking laundering service that you had, and <laughs> and, and and now you're this uh, r big big selling writer. So is this is this going to be kind of what you do for for quite a while? You think? Well, I don't know. I know how to do money laundering, so maybe I think there's more money there. <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, now I know how to do it. So, well, I yeah, I've I've decided I'm a full time writer now. You know, so I work seven days a week on writing and promoting. Um, so that's what I'm doing, and I'm working harder than I've ever worked. So yeah, um, yeah, and yeah. 
it, it gives great meaning to your life. It, and it's a way to synthesize all the aspects of yourself, right? Because there's all the banking there, what I did before, and then there's all the character stuff and other things I'm interested in. Yeah. Now it gives you meaning, and you can still launder money <laughs> yeah, yeah. out of the bookstore. Well, it gives it gives greater meaning to the money laundering. Well, for sure, you understand it the importance now. Um, <laughs> yeah. So now here, here we go. Now, are you big time social media guy? Do you have website? Do you have uh, you know on TikTok dancing and stuff? Where do people find you? No, that 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 would be a horror TikTok. Um, I'm not on TikTok, and I'm not on Twitter. But I'm very active on Facebook. Uh, I've got a newsletter. I'm active on Instagram. So uh, I, I do all those things. And I have, you know, an email. Uh, you know, you can just contact me, Carl Vondero, author at gmail.com. And I like, you know, communicating with people. Yeah. Do you, do you like getting reviews? How do you, how do you, because that's something you probably never mm. got as a banker, right? People don't go into the bank and then review you so much as they do. As a writer, how do you, how do you react or deal with that? Well, as a banker, you get reviewed once or twice a year, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's often mediocre, and sometimes it's not often bad, but you know it happens, and then it's scary. Um, uh, but as a writer, getting these reviews, it's uh, I find it hard because you know I've got ninety some reviews on this book, and it's coming out tomorrow, and Goodreads. And, um, you know, what do you do as a writer? You always go to the bad reviews. Right. You know, there are a couple of two-star reviews, and so, of course, immediately I read those, and I think, oh, I could have done this differently, I could have done that differently. But It's amazing you read them. I have a policy of not reading my Goodreads reviews. I'll look at the Amazon ones, but, um, I mean, people will, will not really even review them. They'll, like, give it a one-star to, like, Almost like a bookmark or something. I don't know. It's very strange. Mm. I don't find yeah, it useful well, um, to edit up. I don't. I don't find it useful to get feedback on a book all that much after it's out. Like, what can you do, really? What can you do? Well, the second edition will be better. I yeah. Guess. <laughs> no, I, I always hunt them down. I find who these people are, and then I have them terminated. Ow, I think that's unhealthy. <laughs> <laughs> it rids the world well, I, of another I, negative person. <laughs> There's a thriller for you. Well, I'm dying for that. Or yeah. be very cathartic. Yeah. Well, <laughs> maybe literally. But, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, Al, we'll talk offline. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't so much. I went, the first books I used to be really intense and looked at everything, and now I'll flash through and just look at the overall like if your overall rating is pretty good, that's good good enough, you know. Yeah, well, yeah, and it's been good. I mean, so far, you know, it's over four, so that's well, good. Well, yeah, that's, that's more than you could ask, right? you yeah, gotta, you got to be yeah. happy, right? That's the way I look yeah. at it. Yeah. yeah. Four is great. And, and, and only 70% of them are my friends. Yeah. <laughs> it's all the, all the friends, family, and bankers and stuff like that. <laughs> Everybody. Oh, I'm not sure the bankers would review it well. Well, you just, you just pay them, right? Part of the percentage of the laundering. Uh, okay, yeah, okay. I know, you got to work this out. Um, so yeah. when you were writing, um, so are you, you said you're a full-time writer now. So are you, do you yeah. actually sit down and do nine to five type thing and, and you can actually go to your writing room, sit down and it's nine o'clock and hit the clock and then just start writing? Or do you have to be in a certain kind of frame of mind or mood? No, well, you know, I found that living on the West Coast, I tend to get up earlier than I did when I lived on the East Coast. So, you know, I'm up at 6.15, 6.30, and I'm trying to get at my desk or somewhere writing by about 7.15 or 7.30. And uh, it could be writing or it could be promotion, you know. Right now, it's, you know, the last month has been all promotion. But then, uh, and I like to go to coffee houses just to get out of the house and uh, so I do that. And, and plus, at a coffee house, there, there are less distractions. No TV, you know. I can't see what's going on at Mar-a-Lago. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, yeah, but, I mean, you know, you see some interesting people. I mean, do you ever draw from people you see out at the coffee house or kind of around the street and kind of go, oh, that would be a good character? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, re I remember seeing a panhandler who I thought was really interesting. He was like a born salesman selling this junk up at one of the strip malls. And I thought, he'd be a great character. 
And in my next book, I put him in, but then I had to end up taking him out because there was just too many characters. But, you know, that happens. And you see, yeah, yeah, you can imagine what people are like. Yeah, I was going to say, how many people did you kill off that you know? <laughs> well, no one that I knew. But <laughs> oh, I find it works better that way. You hear, you, you do, we always, this is a question that comes up a lot, is that sort of the, the, it's therapy <laughs> put in characters of people, even just random people that annoy you, you know, some garage person yeah. at the grocery store or something. You're like, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to put in my book yeah. and I'm going to get, you know, run over by a you know, tractor trailer or something. But like, um, it's it's funny. I I don't do this. I <laughs> so so do so you say. Well, yeah, that's the yeah. official. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do amalgamations of people I didn't like in bank. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and if I really didn't like them, I kill them slowly. Yeah, painful, long, painful, painful. So let's 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 get a few names out here so that we can we can give them a call and get them on the line here. <laughs> 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 oh, they're dead. Oh. <laughs> he really, he really kills them. He doesn't just kill them in the book. He really kills them. Yeah, I mean, you know, some some of my friends in banking said, well, am I in the book? And I am the book. And I said, yeah, you're one of the victims. <laughs> you know, that usually shuts them down. <laughs> yeah, <really. laughs> yeah, swearing under their breath, you know. Did you did you write over the COVID part? You know, all that. I did, yeah. How was yeah, that for I wrote you? the whole time. Like, what what happened with you? Did it affect you? Well, I wrote this book over COVID, and I wrote 50,000 words for the next book over COVID at the end of COVID. So, so it was good for you. Know, doesn't mean they were – yeah, yeah, I guess it was. But, you know, everybody and their uncle wrote a book over COVID. So the competition was pretty fierce out there. Well, not really. There's a lot of people that shouldn't be writing. But <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, so – And so somebody probably said that about us at one point. They still do. <laughs> <laughs> they still do. There you go. <laughs> That's that one-star review person, you know. Oh. Well, no, but oh. I was just – do you think that um, when you're in that setting, but so you've got – anti-maskers and you got all the people and all the tension and the politics and all this stuff going on and the COVID and, the, and you're sitting at home. Do, how do you think that affects what you write? Do you think it gives a different or a darker tone maybe to what you write? I don't know. Well, you're alone more. Yeah. So you can go deeper, darker, or you can darker, deeper rather, because you don't have people pulling you up. Um, that certainly is, is, uh, and the other decision is to what extent you put COVID into the book. And I, I purposely didn't do it in this one. I, I don't know whether I went darker because of COVID. I was certainly more alone. I was more at home. Um, I, no, I think this book is less dark than the first one, Murderabilia. So, you know, well, Murderabilia was pretty dark. Was that the name of your next book, A Deeper Darker? <laughs> <laughs> no, we won't touch that one. I've, I've, I've noticed. I mean, you're, you're, it's not like you're writing standalones. Do you think that's something that's yeah. going to continue for you, or do you think you'll go into series? Or uh, uh, well, the next book is a standalone, and I'm thinking this book, Saving Miles, um, could have a sequel. But uh, and I've thought about some possibilities, but I haven't done that so far. I've I've liked writing standalones too. Get into completely different characters. Well, it's certainly been an inter interesting conversation. So, where do where do people find you? You're going to Beltracon and all that. Like, where are, what's what's coming up for you? Well, I'm at Warwick's uh, tomorrow night. Uh, I'm in Orange County, and the, well, I'm at the San Diego Festival of Books the next weekend or this weekend. I'm in Orange County at Book Carnival on Sunday, doing some other things. So, the best thing is to go to my website and see where I'll be. Um, or sign up for my newsletter, and at the end of that, it'll show all the places I am, including this one. So uh, it's, you know, um, at Mystery Radio. So um, uh, I guess that's yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, my website is Um every My Instagram is Carl Vondero. My Facebook is Carl Vondero. Um, so as long as you know how to spell my name, um, you, I'm pretty easy to find. Well, we'll make sure that it's up on our website. Everyone can find you one click easily, and they don't know, need to know how to spell your name. So, well, there we go. All, there we go. All, they just need to follow yeah, you. It'll be easy. It's nothing but convenience. It'll be easy. Like, we're all about convenience. Yeah, you, you, 
You going to put a purchase button there too? <laughs> you know, I, I will. Yeah, not a problem. You do? Oh, yeah. great. Great. I just don't know how great. you, how do you launder the money if they purchase online, right? You got to register. <laughs> I don't, mm. It's not, I don't know. You, mm. The plot of your next yeah. book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I have to think about that. You have one. to get part yeah. two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll find somebody at Amazon who wants to do a business. Well, here, I, I got Basil's uh, cell number. I'll give it to you. you give him a call. <laughs> See what happens. Well, the book we're talking about, of course, is Saving Miles, and the person saving miles is Mr. Carl Vondero. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. Really enjoyed this. Thanks, Carl. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.